Good evening and thank you for joining us for this evening CPD on general protections claims under part 3.1 of the Fair Work Act and the further evolution once again of this fast moving jurisdiction. Tonight Matt Harker and I will be looking at three broad areas of development of importance to both employers and employees in this significant area. As you've no doubt seen, over recent years, there have been a number of full court decisions that have expanded and developed the general protections jurisdiction. Most of those decisions flow from applications made pursuant to just a couple of sections within part 3.1 of the Fair Work Act, most commonly sections 341, subsection 1, subsection C, as well as section 351. Those are the provisions applicants very commonly bring claims under and employers commonly defend against. Appellate decisions arising from claims brought under both of those provisions are therefore of equal importance to both employers and employees and often have application across the entire jurisdiction. This talk focuses therefore tonight on one of those legislative provisions, namely section 341, subsection 1, subsection C, Roman 2, which is a mouthful each and every time, and the judicial divergence that arose in earlier years before the full court settled the question in 2019 in the decision of Cigarette and Gift Warehouse and Whelan, which was applied by the majority of the full court in Peer and King in 2020, and then again at the end of last year in Alum and NAB. And we'll consider the, um, those cases as well as um, a number of other full court decisions and uh, first instance decisions of the federal court um, and look at the principle, the same principle that was applied throughout those three key decisions. We'll look as well at some recent developments under the new jurisdictional objection that employer respondents have available to them as a result of the full court decision at the end of 2020 in coal supply chain and Milford. And um, there have been a numerous, uh, there have been numerous decisions flowing from this new jurisdictional objection available to employers based on the assertion from the employer that there was in fact no dismissal sufficient to render the application competent. And these decisions have commonly arisen where an employee has alleged that he or she has been dismissed or forced to resign and the employer disputes that. And then we'll round off with a look at the um, implications of uh, Rue Hizzard again and Matt will correct my pronunciation of the name of that case shortly, I'm sure the Rue Hizidigan litigation um, and uh, after it went to the full court um, at the end of last year and then the High Court refused special leave um, last year. And before I move on further, I'll introduce uh, Matt Harker, who is a fabulous new addition to our floor. Before being called to the bar, Matt practised as a solicitor for four years, appearing as an advocate in the Supreme Court, Land and Environment Court, local court and in tribunals. He practices in high level matters across, a broad, um, across broad areas of the law, including employment, competition and consumer law, constitutional and administ administrative law and planning and environmental law. And Matt has in addition completed a Masters of Law at uh, University College London, putting us all to shame, focusing on constitutional and national security law and he worked as an associate at the AAT. Now, I'll just start by um, introducing this area before handing over to Matt, who's going to go through some of the recent decisions that we've seen flowing as a result of the new juris uh, jurisdictional objection uh, based on there being an assertion by the employer that there was no dismissal. So. Section 365 of the Fair Work Act, as we know, is the gateway to the general protections jurisdiction um, and makes provision if there's been a termination of employment, not if there hasn't been a termination of employment, but it makes uh, provision for an applicant to commence a general protections application in the Fair Work Commission and then um, proceed to a conciliation conference. And, of course, once the... Um, termination certificate is obtained under section 368 subsection 3, the applicant can then elect to proceed either to the federal court or uh, the federal circuit court. Um, now the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia, but 
In any event, as you can see, the key words in section 365, as the full court um, held in the decision of coal supply chain in Milford at the end of 2020, um, was whether a person has been dismissed. And the uh, full court said in coal supply chain of Milford that that was a jurisdictional matter that um, what had to be dealt with. It was a, um, had to be dealt with as an antecedent matter. It had to be addressed first and it had to be addressed by the Fair Work Commission. So in coal supply chain of Milford, um, that started life, of course, in the Fair Work Commission and the, um, the applicant uh, had been terminated in 2016 and then commenced a general protections claim in 2018. And Coles, of course, ran an argument first, well, that the, the application was out of time, and then later said the applicants are casual, so there can be no dismissal. There was no dismissal um, because, as a matter of law, uh, a casual can't be dismissed, and the Fair Work Commission and then the Fair Work Commission full bench applied an earlier long-standing full bench decision, the decision of Hewitt and Tapero nominees, which said the Fair Work Commission can't decide whether or not there's been a dismissal. That has to go through to the Federal Court or the Federal Circuit Court. And um, the, uh, the Fair Work Commission can, of course, decide if something is out of time, if an application is out of time. And so Coles sought judicial review, of course, of that decision and went to a full court and the full court unanimously said, no, that's wrong. Hewitt and Tapero nominees is just, no, that's wrong. Um, and the Fair Work Commission can decide it and has to decide it if it's raised by the employer and that's the new jurisdictional objection that is, of course, now available um, to employers as soon as an application is filed with the Fair Work Commission. Um, and the full court also said that if the Fair Work Commission errs on that question and says it can't make the decision as to whether there's been a dismissal, then it can go back to the um, federal court. But that's pretty unlikely. There's been dozens and dozens of those decisions now over the last 15 or so months. Um, and, of course, a respondent form, F8A, has been amended so that um, employers can simply make the jurisdictional objection. And um, then... There's a couple of full bench decisions last year and um, this year that have set out the very summary principles in coal supply chain in Milford, it's Zhang and Medlab um, and uh, Bowen, and it just says that the application isn't competent. Well, um, the application must be competent. There has to be a dismissal before the application is competent and before the commission can take any step. But as a matter of practicality, if the parties consent to going to conciliation first, the Fair Work Commission will, in fact, um, allow that to be a step that is taken. And um, for cost effectiveness, they will allow the parties to go ahead and uh, do that, um, conciliate. So it, critically, the term dismissed is um, now settled, of course, also by the full court in Milford. Um, the full court in Milford simply adopted the definition in section 386, so section 12 is a dictionary and it takes you straight to section 386. But um, before Milford, uh, there had been some federal circuit court decisions, Fair Work Ombudsman and Ostrand and Morris and Allied Express, and those had um, interpreted, well, they, they had adopted um, the definition of dismissal or dismissed in section 386, but there had been, of course, a question because section 386 isn't in part 3.1. It doesn't relate to general protections. It was designed for the unfair dismissal jurisdiction. And so there had been some toing and froing as to whether or not section 386 ever applied to the general protections jurisdiction. And uh, happily now the question is answered and it does um, and so that means the first thing that is key in a jurisdictional objection is um, whether there's been a dismissal within one of the two limbs of section 386 and there have been a number of full bench decisions of the Fair Work Commission that says they're two separate limbs, they mean completely different things. Um, subsection A means terminated at the employer's initiative and subsection B means forced to resign because of the employer's conduct. Um, 
and or where there's no reasonable choice. So, in other words, a constructive dismissal and a common law, that's a repudiation. Acceptance of the repudiation, of course, results in the termination of the contract. And there have been numerous recent decisions of the Fair Work Commission where this um, has been exactly the issue at subsection B that has been the focal point, and that's what Matt's just about to take you to now. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Many thanks, Penny, and don't worry, everyone won't be playing a bit of musical chairs, so um, Penny will be back to speak to you about Alum and Pia very shortly. Um, so turning first to the first limb of dismissal, 386.1a, this is termination at the initiative of the employer. Now, there's some important caveats to this. The first is that resignation is not legally effective when it's expressed in the heat of the moment where there's no real intention to resign. And this is your real Hollywood type of resignation, the one that everyone dreams of one day doing at some point. So the employee has an argument, decided they've had enough, and in the midst of the argument, throw the toys out with the pram and say, I quit. Well, often that's not a resignation and it's caught employers out on a number of occasions. So an employer generally should clarify after a reasonable time that the employee actually genuinely intended to resign. Um, and to give you one example where this is essentially tripped an employer up, in Bupa Aged Care and Tavasili, which is a really useful case for employment lawyers because it sets out a lot of the relevant principles in relation to um, dismissal. There's an employee with poor English, who was very emotional in the midst of a disciplinary, disciplinary meeting and resigned. Now, instead of the employer taking steps to clarify with the employee whether they wanted to resign, the employer actually suggested an amendment to the resignation letter that the employee had prepared. And the full, full bench of the Fair Work Commission held that that was a termination at the, init at the invitation and ultimately on the initiative of the employer. So that was a dismissal falling within section 386.1a. So that's the, the main thing to think about when you're dealing with a termination on the initiative of an, uh, looks like a termination by the employee, but there's a risk that it may actually by, be by the employer. Now turning to, to the main one that we're gonna talk about today, which is 386.1b. This is a forced resignation. And, and 386.1b refers to a forced resignation because of the conduct or, cause, or, course of, or a course of conduct engaged in by the employer. And generally, it's been reiterated by the courts and, and the Fair Work Commission on many occasions. What the court's looking at is that it's conduct that's intended or could have the probable result of bringing the employment to an end. There must be some critical action of the employer and force encompasses actions of an employer to persuade an employee to resign. There has to be some element of compulsion. Now, this test is assessed objectively. The courts and the Fair, Fair Work Commission have emphasised on many occasions you need to look at the employer's conduct as a whole. Just because an employee felt that they had no choice to resign doesn't mean that there's a forced resignation. And that point is made in, in many cases, most recently quite well in Wilson and Westpac Bank, West Bank Banking Corporation. Importantly also, whether employees, employers' conduct results directly or consequently in termination is an important consideration, but it's not the only consideration. That's because you also need to consider amongst other factors, the employee's response and the appropriateness of the employee's response to the employer's conduct. This raises the question, what is and what is not repudiation? Some, there's a good case called Davidson in the Commonwealth of Australia, who a lot of you are probably familiar with. It's been around for almost 11 years, 
but it actually provides a really useful summary of some of the factors that don't amount to repudiation and therefore for forced resignation. So on, on their own, and I stress this, on their own, investigating employee misconduct doesn't necessarily amount to repudiation. Requesting an employee to return company property. Barring an employee from IT access to or to premises during an investigation. And promising to suspend an employee while investigation, well, sorry, proposing to suspend an employee while investigating provided the employee is paid. And this is quite important. Um, there was a recent case, which some of you probably remember with the um, Debelin, De De the um, St George Forward, who was accused of sexual assault and was stood down by his club. Um, he took action in the federal court, arguing that that action was a restraint of trade. And the court actually took pause to consider when an employee could be stood down without pay. And the court said, and this is the line with a long line of authority, that there is no power at common law to suspend an employee pending an investigation or because of misconduct without pay. You either fire them or you suspend them and you pay them full freight. Now that's subject to an enterprise agreement or in terms of an employment contract, but generally, and this is something employers need to be very careful about, if you suspend someone, you generally should pay them. And there's also a question that in circumstances where you do suspend somebody and force them to fund their own suspension, either by using their annual leave or um, if they're forced to take leave without pay, whether that amounts to repudiation of the contract. So some other things that aren't repudiation, Subjecting an employee to disciplinary procedures. Won't be repudiation where an employee resigns before an investigation is concluded. And that includes where the, employee, the employer indicates to the employee that the outcome of the investigation may be a dismissal. If the employee tries to preempt that and quits, they've gone too soon. Now, there's a really interesting question that Penny and I actually had to deal with earlier this year, is whether commencing proceedings against an employee amounts to repudiation of a contract. I mean, instinctively, you think it probably does. It's a pretty drastic step to take to actually sue one of your employees, and it tends to suggest that the trust that underpins the employment relationship is probably at an end, but it's not that simple. So think of this situation you commonly have where an employer is investigating potential employee misconduct. In the course of that investigation, the employer asks the employee to hand over passwords or documents that are confidential. The employee doesn't do so. What are your options? Well, question one is, is for an employer, can you fire them because they have failed to comply with the lawful direction to produce passwords and documents? But even if you do that, and just assume for present purposes that you don't, how do you get the documents back? Well, generally, when an employer is left and they're going to an, a, a, a competitor, you'll march up to the Supreme Court and seek an injunction. But in circumstances where the employment relationship hasn't been terminated, does that amount to repudiation of the contract? Well, this hasn't actually been considered by the Fair Work Commission or in the employment con context in Australia, so it's unclear. However, in other situations, primarily dealing with commercial contracts, the courts have said that commencing proceedings isn't in and of itself repudiatory, repudiatory unless it is totally abusive or lacking in good faith. And the authority for that, which we've included in the slides, is a decision by the um, Court of Appeal in the UK of Woodar Investment Development and Wimpy. And that's been referred to um, by the Federal Court and the full Court of the Federal Court on a couple of occasions. In terms of an Australian authority, um, Lombok is essentially to the same effect. 
Um, the court emphasises there that it depends on the circumstances of the case and really what is alleged. And if you're making some serious allegations of, of theft against an employee, then that may suggest that the employment contract is at, a, is at an end and there's been a repudiation. So bearing that in mind, if you, as Penny pointed out initially, if you have either a dismissal on the initiative of an employer, other than you know, the heat of the moment situation, <laughs> which you referred to before, um, or a situation where an employer is forced to resign because of the conduct of the employer, then you have a dismissal and there's jurisdiction for the Fair Work Commission. And that means that essentially the ap application can proceed to conciliation. Certificate will in all likelihood be issued under Section 368.3. And you can then proceed to the Federal Court or the Federal Circuit Court. Remember, the first thing, if you're an employer, if you're, if you're acting for an employer and you receive an application, first question to ask is, has there been a dismissal? And consider those factors in Davidson. Consider whether there's been a repudiation if it's not at the initiative of the employer. And again, also, if it looks like the employee has resigned, consider whether the resignation was in the heat of the moment because if it was, it may be that there is a termination on the initiative of the employer. And on that, I'll hand back to Penny. Thank you, Matt. So as um, Matt was just saying, so where the application is found to be competent, of course, and the matter proceeds to court, then um, one of the most common general protections claims uh, is a claim under section 341, subsection 1, subsection C, and that's underpinned, of course, by the prohibition in section 340, the two operate together, uh, and um, section 340, of course, says that you can't take adverse action against another person if they have a workplace right, if they exercise or they do not exercise a workplace right, or they propose or propose not to exercise a workplace right. And section 341, subsection 1, subsection C, Roman 2, is the, um, has been the focal point of the federal court and the full federal court for the last few years. And that provides, of course, that a person has a workplace right if the person is able to make a complaint or inquiry um, if the person is an employee in relation to his or her employment. And so the words of the section are key and the first aspect of the um, formula is whether or not there is a complaint or inquiry and then the second aspect of the formula is whether the employee is able to make the complaint or inquiry. And it's long been established um, since Shea and True Energy number six in 2014 that a complaint means an expression of grievance or fault. Not everything that is done or said is a complaint or an inquiry. And it's a fairly specific formula and it's spelled out more fully than that in Shea and True Energy number six. Um, and the full court in Cummins, South Pacific and Keenan uh, simply uh, adopted that or the majority adopted that. Um, and that's the accepted formula. Significantly, however, there's no complaint if the employee was merely complying with his or her responsibility or obligation to report. For instance, then the employee is simply reporting. So if there's a contractual obligation to report, then, um, or even a statutory obligation to report, that's not a complaint. That's just doing what the contract or the statute requires the employee to do. And that was the finding by Justice Stewart in Environmental Group um, Limited and Bowd in 2019. In that case, Bowd was the CEO, um, Environmental Group Limited commenced proceedings against Bowd for breach of copyright. Bowd 
cross-claimed um, and said that he, uh, if, uh, he made a cross-claim under Section 341, subsection 1, subsection C, said that he'd been terminated because he'd been making complaints. But his, the way he had pleaded the case was that he had been reporting as a CEO to the Board of Directors in line with his contract of employment. And Justice Stewart said, no, that's not a complaint. That's just reporting to the board in compliance um, with your contractual um, requirements under um, exactly as you are required to do. But that was tied closely to the way the case had been pleaded. So it's incredibly important for both employer uh, respondents and employee applicants to have a look at the way the case gets um, pleaded um, for exactly that reason. And then an inquiry, of course, has been considered recently again by Justice Stewart. Both of those decisions, the decision in Marrick and Erickson and Fledgel and We Drive, they were both uh, decisions of Justice Stewart. And he's, um, he's almost really extended out the notion of what is an, an inquiry and um, that's now got uh, some parameters around it in the same way that a complaint does. And then finally, getting on to the key words that have been at the heart of a number of full court decisions in the last few years, whether or not an employee is able to make a complaint. And so this was considered in 2014 in Shay number six, and in Shay number six, it was said that the, uh, the words able to make are not at large and an employee is not able to make a complaint unless the, um, there is a source of entitlement and it has to be founded on contract or statute or some other instrument. And this was said in Cigarette and Gift Warehouse and Whelan in 2019 um, by the full court unanimously, that statement was said to be, well, I've got here correct, but the words were unremarkable and correct and those words don't fit comfortably in a slide, but that's what the full court said, that the finding that um, the words able to make are not at large but must be found on a source of entitlement, whether instrumental or otherwise, were accepted unanimously by the full court in Cigarette and Gift Warehouse in Whelan. And then... Um, that was applied, both Shea and Whelan were applied in Bowd in um, June 2019 by Justice Stewart. And then uh, in the decision in Peer and King, the majority of the full court later in, 2019, uh, in 2020 found that um, they applied, the majority applied Whelan and simply said exactly the same thing, that the words are not at large um, but must be founded on a source of entitlement and the source of entitlement in Peer and King was both the contract as well as a statutory source, namely the Australian Consumer Law. And we'll have a look at that in just a moment. Um, and, again, it was applied in Fledgel as well. Then in Cummins, the full court in Cummins again had a look at this, but it did not need to be decided. Um, and so what Justice Bromberg held at um, in that decision with Justice Mortimer agreeing um, was obita. It wasn't the ratio of the decision, and that's important because then at the end of last year, the full court in Allum and NAB again had a look at it and they said exactly that, that um, Justice Bromberg's um, uh, observations in Cummins were obiter and therefore um, they, there was nothing binding about it. Um, but Justice Bromberg essentially said, of course, um, had it been necessary, he would have found that the majority in Peer was wrong. Uh, His Honour said that there was a lack of clarity in both Whelan and Shea number six. Um, however, the federal court after that continued to apply the majority in peer and, and said, in addition, there's the allied question of whether or not the um, conduct is related to the employment, the complaint or inquiry relates to the employment. So um, it looked like um, it was far less clear um, by the time that the full court in Cummins came along and there did appear to be um, some judicial, di uh, judicial divergence at that point. But if we have a look at um, here, 
and King, that um, is a decision that gives a good outline as to um, where the source or, and the entitlement comes from. Um, when uh, an applicant makes an allegation that there's been a breach of both contract and a statutory breach. So the Australian Consumer Law and Contract were the two um, breaches alleged by the applicant who was the CEO of a finance company and the employer foreshadowed terminating him and the employee emailed the employer and said, well, if you do that, you're going to be breaching my contract or, and or the ACL, plus I think you've already done it. And um, in that case, the decision maker, who was the director of the employer, refused to give any evidence, uh, um, refused to um, give evidence at all on the reasons for the termination and instead relied upon the termination letter. And the termination letter, unfortunately for the employer, um, stated that the reasons included the making of demands. So it shows how important, and we'll come to that again in just a moment, it shows how important it is to have all of the evidence and give particularly in respect of um, the reasons for the termination and leading up to the termination. Um, and uh, in that case, of course, the majority upheld the first instance decision and found, as we just had a look at, um, that the employee, Mr King, was able to um, make a complaint and essentially set out those um, findings which applied wheel and, and was in line with uh, Shea number six. And so then at the end of last year, uh, there was a further consideration, but there wasn't a great deal um, to consider according to the full court in Alam and NAB. The applicant was employed for three months. Well, that's not why it wasn't the factual issues, but um, it was the legal issues. The applicant was employed for three months. She made a series of complaints and then she was terminated. Um, NAB alleged for um, emailing confidential information to herself and the application was dismissed at first instance in the Federal Circuit Court. And in the um, full court, the full court held that because um, the finding in, by the majority in Peer was, um, was the ratio of the decision, but in Cummins it was Obertar, Peer and Cummins weren't competing authorities. So that's essentially the important takeaway that, um, and then Alam and Nab uh, um, simply applied the unanimous decision in Whelan um, and said, and the full court said that they couldn't deviate from peer, they could only deviate from peer if they could find that it was wrong. And at the end of last year, there was um, a decision from Minister of Immigration and FAK 19, um, which examined the basis on which um, the full court can deviate from another full court's ratio decision, essentially. Um, and the full court in uh, Alam and NAB said it was not a state of satisfaction that was easily reached. So, therefore, the full court in Alam applied Whelan, saying that that gave effect to comedy um, and was in line with peer. But unfortunately for the parties, the matter has been remitted back to a, another judge um, in the Federal Circuit Court, um, the, of the Federal Circuit and Family Court. Um, but overall, that means the principle continues to be um, settled in effect. Um, but it's helpful, that decision is helpful as well if anyone needs to look at a um, very good summary by the full court of section 361 um, principles and the rebuttable presumption, which is incredibly useful at paragraph 14. Plus, um, it really shows the necessity for both parties of adducing all the evidence that's relevant to um, the termination of employment, which was exactly the same kind of situation in Rumble and the same situation in Rue Hizidigan, um, which we'll come to in just a moment. So the matter has been remitted um, and there was simply, um, it's been remitted, there may, 
or may not have been that kind of a finding had there been sufficient evidence on um, the events leading up to the dismissal. And I will hand back over to Matt. Thank you, Penny. Now for the very last stage of our presentation, we're going to talk about compensation. Um, court has a very, very broad power to order compensation under Section 545 of the Fair Work Act. Um, I mean, the key provision there and the key qualification to the court's power is that court can award compensation for loss because of the contravention. So it imports a causation requirement, which we'll touch on in a moment. Um, there's multiple different measures of compensation that the court can adopt. Um, first, as an example, we've got Cassis and the Republic of Lebanon, which is from 2014. Um, Ms. Cassis was employed in the Lebanese Foreign S Service and guess the what? That means she had tenure, one of the very lucky employees to have tenure. Um, and she was essentially dismissed and um, she was given, sorry, awarded two years full pay. And then after that, um, she, was ordered, she was awarded compensation for loss of earnings um, on the assumption that she would work part-time up until her retirement at 65 years. Um, she was already 60, so it wasn't an extensive payout, but um, particularly compared to two other cases, which we're going to turn to now. First is the Howe Creek Coal case. That's where um, compensation was assessed on the basis of from the date of the person's termination up till the end of the project. That was a quite mammoth payout there of one point, almost 1.3 million. And then Ruhiza Dagan, which I'll talk to in a bit more depth shortly, but it's one of the biggest payouts I've ever seen. I think, Penny, you've probably ever seen as well. Um, 5.1 million in damages it included about 4.5 years of economic loss, um, as well as loss of share options. But quite interestingly, Mr. Ruhizidigan wanted much, much more. And the matter has now been remitted back to the federal court. And I expect that they're going to argue for much more than the 4.5 years, which they awarded. And in, in fact, I think when the matter went to the full court of the federal court, um, they're asking for almost about 27 years of compensation for lost wages, which I think is going to be a bit of a hard one to win, but um, we'll, we'll see. Um, another important point to make is, is in Qantas and Gamma in 2008, the full court of the federal court emphasised that Section 4, 5, 45 doesn't always mean full compensation. So where breach is one of breach of the act is one of many causes, then that may be taken into account in assessing the amount of the compensation. So you might not get everything and only a portion. So some important considerations in terms of the court's approach to assessing compensation. The big case, which employers quite love and it's very harsh on employees, is uh, DAFLA and the Fair Work Commission in 2014. And in essence, the main principle there, which I'm sure most of you know, is that the, um, in calculating damages, the court will often approach that exercise on the basis that the employer is entitled to terminate the employee in the way most beneficial to it. So if the employer has another legitimate reason to sack an employee, um, that may reduce the amount of damages, that compensation that's payable almost to nothing. And a good example of that is the case of Kennywell and Atkins. So this is a case where an employee was dismissed for complaining that he'd not been paid annual entitlements. Um, struggle to see how somebody thought that would be a good basis for a dismissal. But in any event, um, the court held that the employee would have been fired shortly thereafter in any event because the employer had already formed a view that their performance was unacceptable 
and on a number of occasions, the employee had actually ab abused their employer. Um, so in that case, the court formed the view that the loss that was sought, which is the loss of earnings flowing on, was not because of the contravention, because the employee would have been fired in any event, applying DAFLA. So the employee in that case only got just under $3,000. Now compare that to the $5 million that Mr. Ruiza Dikan got, and that's, it's not a good outcome at all. Um, another important thing is when you're dealing with a casual, it's almost impossible for a casual to identify any loss because they've got no regular work, and that's part of the manner in which um, and, and the legal framework in which casual employment exists. Um, and as I said initially, because of those two words in Section 5452, because of, you need to point to a causal connection between the loss and the contravention of the Act. Can't just assert that there's non-economic loss, um, and and typically the court will apply you know, the usual common law test for causation, March and Stromer, and approaching that. So, next question is how the courts go about distinguishing DAFLA. Say, for instance, if you tend to act for employees. Now, Ruhiza Degan is a is a good example of this. Um, Justice Kerr, who had since retired, um, essentially distinguished Daffalar in this case, and I'll just give you a brief outline first before we dive into what he said. In essence, Mr. Ruhiza Degan made seven allegations of bullying under the workplace policy, and he was dismissed. The court held that the allegations were complaints that the applicant was able to make based on the contractual entitlements. Um, and the onus on the employer was to show that the, the sorry, the um, termination was for another reason, was not discharged. So in essence, in those circumstances, his honour found that there had been a breach of the Act and awarded that quite significant sum of compensation that I alluded to before. And in doing that, His Honour sought to distinguish Daffala. Now, the, the argument put toward, to His Honour was that the relationship had completely broken down as Mr. Ruhizadegan was being bullied, peers in the extreme, and he would have quit in any event. Therefore, the employer should not be responsible for um, the, the loss of the employee. And, and His Honour rejected that very quickly. Um, there was a criticism, not on this point, but in other parts of His Honour's reasoning by the full court of the federal court. But in essence, His Honour's held in quite strong terms that you can't just say that an employee would be bullied into quitting and therefore there's no entitlement to compensation. And it's hard to disagree with that, particularly in circumstances where the employer is, appears to be relying upon unlawful conduct to say that the employment would have ended anyway. Um, the, the other point to make here, and it, it's not quite clear in his honour's reasoning, but um, when you're dealing with a general protections claim, um, you can't say that because of, or well, you know, tied to the protected reason, he would have been fired anyway. Um, because that really all does is perpetuate the breach again. You need to point to some other legitimate reason, which is the reason why the employee either was or would have been fired. So his honours. Judgment was appealed to the full court, the federal court. It was handed down last year and special leave was dismissed in the high court. And the full court overturned his honour um, solely on the basis that the court came to the conclusion that his honour failed to have regard to the whole of the evidence regarding the reasons for dismissal and give adequate reasons. And in this case, the full court seemed to be um, quite taken with some of the evidence of the employer that the um, 
complaints were not the reason for the dismissal, but there was another legitimate reason for the dismissal and that that needed to be assessed and remitted the matter back to the full court and to a new judge on the to the federal court and to a new judge on the federal court to um, hear the case again. Um, and because of that finding, there was no comment by the full court on his honour's approach to Daffala. And also a second question, which I alluded to before, um, which Mr. Ruhezadegan um, sought economic loss to be calculated up to his retirement age of 27 years and not just to the expiry of his contract four years. Um, that particular question was not considered by the full court either. So that matter has been remitted, the whole of the matter has been remitted and it may resurface again. So I think keep your eyes out um, for a decision of the federal court in Ruhisitagan because it could be quite significant in terms of the approach towards DAFLA, but also um, the approach towards calculating economic loss because I tell you, um, 27 years of economic loss is quite a significant amount to ask for, particularly given the authority that I pointed out to before that if the employer can appoint to some legitimate reason um, on the assumption that they're going to act in the most beneficial way possible to the employer, um, Often there's a hard cap on the amount that an employee will be able to recover in compensation. So that brings our presentation today to a conclusion. Um, but Penny and I would be more than happy to field any questions that you have. I think there's um, in the Starleaf platform, I think there's an option to raise your hand. Um, please don't be shy. We definitely won't crucify you. <laughs> But if everyone's happily perhaps in their doonas, on their couches or something, relaxing. Okay, so thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, and we hope to actually see you in person sometime soon.